Thank you. Thanks for having me here. This is, uh, <clears throat> this is my second time, I guess, uh, being here in this room. And I'm very proud today because I found this room in less than 10 minutes. So <laughs> that's for me a record for a CHS, so I'm getting better. <laughs> but I cheated because I asked three people on my way. <laughs> so that's maybe the smarter way. <clears throat> a lot of construction, by the way. So today I'm going to talk about um, our work and uh, on, on the use of computation for specifically imaging microscopy, sensing and diagnostics, uh, with an emphasis on uh, global health. Some of these slides I've shown uh, before, it was probably one or two years ago, uh, with the older version of this room. So uh, anybody who has listened to my talk before uh, in this room or somewhere on campus? So that's cool. <laughs> 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 that's cool. So. Um, yes, we use uh, computation. At the, at the heart of our uh, tools uh, lies computation because uh, uh, we believe computation now, nowadays is very powerful. It's almost everywhere. And uh, most often, uh, essentially, we, we utilize uh, the cell phone as the infrastructure. I'd like to start my talk by essentially showing you this graph, which is uh, comparing transistor count in our CPUs, in our computers, computer chips, and their growth versus the megapixel count of your cell phones. Transistor is uh, <clears throat> what's, ha what's uh, if you open up your computer and the, the chip there, what's, what, whatever is uh, like Intel, whatever, that's uh, having millions of transistors, okay? And um, uh, the blue dots here is showing you how the transistor count has been increasing over the, just the last 10 years. It's a trend that is known as the Moore's Law. How many of you heard about Moore's Law? Gordon Moore is the co-founder of Intel and he predicted some 40 years ago that the density of transistors would double almost every 18 months to two, uh, two years, roughly. It's an empirical law and it, it, it was true. It, it literally is the, is the backbone of our uh, computer systems and all the internet being so fast, so powerful. And it's thanks to this trend, doubling every two years, roughly. But what I show here is a comparison of how your megapixels uh, in your cell phones uh, have been increasing uh, over the last 10 years, starting from 0.2 megapixels. So this is around 2002, and you had around 0.2 megapixels. Now you have reached more than 40 megapixels at the back of your cell phone, some of the smartphones that I'm talking about. This trend is following the Moore's Law, doubling the megapixel count every two years. I want to highlight this because it tells you something. Your cell phones now have very advanced optoelectronic components, very advanced cameras that are getting almost as competitive as their professional lab-grade versions. And we tap into this resource to, to make something new out of this to essentially even look at bacteria or single viruses using your cell phone. I'll show you examples of that, and I'll show you stories about what this Moore's Law projected onto megapixel count of cell phones um, has enabled us uh, over the last couple of years in terms of biomedical imaging. In addition to the hardware, we also like cell phones because there's a huge volume about cell phones. Literally, there are 7 billion cell phone subscribers. This is a relatively old slide. This number is literally now slightly above 7 billion. And more than 70% of these cell phones are being used in developing parts of the world. So if you add up all these, we have fantastic images, fantastic hardware, optical hardware, as well as computational elements, graphics processing units in our cell phones, and the volume. They work almost everywhere, uh, cost-effectively uh, in, in a compact form. This creates a unique infrastructure to tap into specifically for biomedical imaging, sensing, and diagnostics. And that's exactly the theme of our lab at UCLA. Right across the campus at the School of Engineering, our lab is creating new platforms for uh, utilizing this infrastructure of the uh, cell phone and cell phone-like smart devices for um, uh, creating new microscopes, as shown here. These are converting a, a cell phone into a fluorescent microscope or a bright field microscope. If you do not want to modify your cell phones with these weird attachments, you're looking into devices that are standalone it use, these utilize the same imager that you have at the back of your cell phones. For example, if you open up this, 
you would find a CMOS imager. It's the same silicon piece that's at the back of your cell phones that are used for capturing pictures. That's what's inside here, which normally would be here. And you can still conduct microscopy uh, using very lightweight, compact, and cost-effective interfaces. These are not your father's microscopes. I'll highlight those. They, they are not just miniaturized microscopes. They are unique. They enable new discoveries that could not be identified before. I'll show you examples of the, those. Uh, beyond just cost effectiveness and miniaturization, there are some fundamental aspects of these microscopes that make them quite more powerful than traditional microscopes. In addition to imaging, in addition to looking at microscale things in specimen, you can also utilize your cell phone with some smart attachments and a, a smart application. This is an Android phone. For example, to test, um, in this case, albumin in urine with a very nice sensitivity on the order of one parts per million. Or you can, for example, uh, look at allergen. This is a peanut detector, also using a unique optomechanical interface to attach to the back of the cell phone camera at the back. And, uh, and another application here to quantify peanut concentration in food extracts. And this is uh, an E. coli detector using um, uh, a similar design. Uh, and I'd like to highlight one of the recent work here, which, which is using the cell phone as a as a blood analyzer for white blood cell total counts, red blood cell total counts, and, and hemoglobin density measurements. Indeed, these gadgets provide us competitive results almost matching the benchtop counterparts in terms of specificity, sensitivity, and the results um, making sense. At the same time, of course, a fraction of the cost and the size of traditional uh, microanalysis, microscopes, the traditional uh, sensors. And we value them because they will enable us to increase essentially uh, useful data extraction from wherever these cell phones work. Uh, in addition to cell phones, there are other kinds of consumer electronics components that we can convert. This is just uh, for the sake of fun. I'll show you a, a flatbed scanner uh, that in this case is uh, working like a fluorescent imager. It's uh, a very large field of view fluorescent microscope that can look at extremely large areas. This field of view here is more than 530 centimeters square. So rather than looking at a millimeter by a millimeter under a microscope, you can have very large areas scanned with these non-conventional imagers. So consumer electronics provide unique opportunities. In addition to the uh, individual elements being cost effective and yet very powerful in terms of performance, there's something more. There's something more than the individual element and that is these are connected set of network, connected set of uh, microscopes or microanalysis devices that form a network. So they will provide a huge amount of data from micro and nano scale that we could not extract before. And that is a great opportunity, and I'd like to highlight that in the, at the end of my presentation, with what this network, which I refer to as the micro internet, could enable, and, and, and what are some of the uh, uh, opportunities as well as challenges that we will face with these uh, microscopes, with these imagers. Um, rather than looking at a few megapixel image, if you are a pathologist, would you like to see a few billion pixels, a few gigapixels, and what would you feel about that? That's the thing that I'd like to point at the end of my presentation. But before, let's start with some of these gadgets and tell you how they work and stories about what are the unique uh, capabilities and unique features of these microscopes. I'll start with these attachments to the cell phone or these devices uh, and tell you how they work. First of all, as I've mentioned in my introduction, these are not your father's microscopes in the sense that they do not use optical components that you normally find in a microscope. They are first of all lens free, meaning that they do not have the objectives or other bulky optical components like lenses that you normally find in an, in an optical microscope. As a result of that, they are very cost effective. If you were to buy a digital camera, a high-end digital camera, the most expensive part of that camera would be the front end lens, right? That's why they're bulky. And that's what the price uh, th that you pay for. But these microscopes do not utilize any of these lenses. That's why they're very tiny. As you can see, this is a quarter here. So they're really uh, very lightweight as well, less than 45 grams in this design. And more importantly, without the use of any lenses, we create extremely high throughput microscopes that can look at large volumes large areas, large depths of a sample volume. That would be very, very important for revealing some rare events. I'll show you some examples of that with human sperms later on. 
what it enabled us. And finally, these are um, highly sensitive microscopes and tolerant to misalignments. This is very important because most of these things, we would like them to be used as field portal microscopes in resource poor settings. And that's where uh, simplicity in design mitigated by computation would be very important to create a tolerant design. In addition to telemedicine, in addition to field portability, there are other applications of these kinds of non-conventional imagers, lens-free imagers. Uh, these are some examples of these lens-free imagers where it's not necessarily cost-effective this time, still very uh, small. Uh, this is like a few centimeters here, but it would, would give you a very large field of view. Now you're looking at 10 to 20 centimeters square. Could be quite useful for looking at rare cells, like circulating tumor cells in, in human blood. That's why uh, I'd like to also mention that there are non-telemedicine related unique applications where on-chip lens-free microscopes, as shown here, could really play a huge role. I'll briefly point to this somewhere in, in the middle of my presentation. Let's come back to lens-free imaging now. If you're not using a lens between your sample, let's, let, let's say it's a cell and your sensor, you can't really image the cell or the, the sample directly. Instead, you can only image the shadow of the cell. What is different for, um, for between us and, for example, a cell is that we're opaque to light, and that's why our shadow is pitch dark. Nothing interesting. But cells are very small, so light penetrates through the three-dimensional body of the cell and casts a unique shadow, which is not anymore just dark. It's actually textured. For example, these are some cells and particles, microscale particles, that we've placed on the top of an imager. So this gray-looking box here is the same silicon chip that you have at the back of your cell phone. It's a CMOS imager. It's what you capture these uh, uh, cell phone images with. If you place your samples very close to it, like less than a millimeter in, in height, and illuminate via um, a simple light emitting diode here, you would see that the photograph that you get is going to contain these unique shadows, which you can treat as the fingerprint of the cell. Okay? They contain these oscillations, which are unique. Let's look at, for example, whole blood. In whole blood, if you were to do the same experiment, same shadow imaging experiment, you would see that these are essentially the shadows of individual red blood cells. And if you were to look closely, you would see uh, the shadows of these white blood cells. So this simple analysis could start to build a cytometer to count cells based on their sh shadows. But this type of a simple ap approach would fail as the density of the cells gets, gets higher. For example, it's the same blood except now we increase the density or reduce the dilution factor. And of course, uh, in, in, in a region like this, you can't really understand what's going on because lots of things overlap. But that's the time to realize that there's more to these dummy looking shadows. They're actually holograms. Okay? They're technically created by interference of light that is scattered by the cell body and interference of it with the background, giving you these, these unique oscillations. Which means you can take an image like this in a computer and take the function of an analog lens and time reverse fields to create a back focus, this diffracted field um, uh, to the object plane, in which case this is the reconstructed image showing you the uh, red blood cells in this case. This entire thing replaces the physical function of a lens with comp computation. It takes less than a millisecond, phenomenally fast, and you can do it across very large areas larger than a conventional microscope. It gives you the same information as a conventional microscope, except without the microscope being there. This is the starting bit. I'll show you more competitive images, but let's start to uh, first uh, get a better feel of this. Whether it's running on a cell phone, using the cell phone's CMOS imager that's here, and this drawer here is where you load your disposable sample. Something like on a glass slide or a microfluidic device is what you insert and after image, you uh, get uh, rid of it. Uh, or again, the same configuration. This is where you load your, uh, this is where you load your sample, and this is where the light source comes in, so that it creates a self-illumination and the shadows are captured. It's the same design, LED, the light emitting diode, the source, light source is here. This is where you load your sample, and it's the same design except in a standalone USB-powered um, design. 
And this is the same thing on a bench top for extreme throughput. So this active area here is around 18 centimeters squared. That's the area where you can look for micro scale things. So depending on your applications, you can choose different platforms, whether for extreme throughput on a bench top or field portability and cost effectiveness used using these kinds of attachments. And they all work based on holography. How many of you uh, read something during your high school or uh, <clears throat> college education about holography? Okay. <laughs> so much for the educational system. <laughs> so these are not conventional holograms that we capture. Conventional holography that you might have heard is uh, essentially captured with lasers. Like this is a laser diode. If you look at, for example, um, the light that I am uh, trying to stabilize there, it's actually uh, the reflection of the wall and it has some speckled patterns. If you look closely, you would see some specular reflections that, that's caused by the interference of light at the back of your retina. Uh, we do not use lasers here, so this is non-conventional holography. It doesn't use coherent light sources like lasers. It uses incoherent light sources. We even use sometimes, for fun, sunlight. So you can go out in LA and do experiments with sunlight to create holographic imaging, these kinds of microscopes. Instead of putting an LED here, you just put a pinhole there and look for the sun to uh, illuminate your sample. So I won't go into the details of the physics of how these holograms are created and reconstructed, but there, there are some very nice physics uh, that enable us to create incoherent holograms and reconstruct them, which you can think of as time reversal. So we digitally time reverse the field so that they focus back um, to the object plane to create an image. So that's kind of like the, uh, the, the, the nice, um, in, in a minute or so, the physics behind it. But uh, I would be happy if you are really more interested into it uh, to send you some of our papers that you can read more. So we start with these dummy looking shadows, which are technically holograms, and then quickly um, retrieve the face of the sample this is the optical phase. And once you have a complex wave, you can time reverse it and go back to the object plane. These are some granulocytes. These are the subcellular features of the granulocyte, a lymphocyte, and some platelets. To, sh to show you always, I'll give you comparisons with a conventional microscope, in this case, a 40x objective. However, these are reconstructions without anything except just a CMOS imager, very inexpensive one, and this tiny uh, field portal microscope that you see. These are lower resolution images. I'll show you tricks to really go to uh, almost a diffraction limit, meaning go, go to a wavelength divided by two, half the wavelength in terms of resolution, like a, a few hundred nanometers. Uh, I'll tell you tricks how you can improve the resolution of these holographic shadows, their reconstructions, so that you can see tinier things. Just to give you an example, this is a, this, these are E. coli particles surrounded by water. And this is a conventional microscope. Seeing E. coli being submicron surrounded by water is a difficult task because it's refractive index matched. And um, that's why I put these arrows to guide your eye. But the lens-free microscope has an advantage to see those weakly scattering things surrounded by uh, liquid because holography is like phase contrast microscopy. It has the advantage that the phase here is very strong giving you a better contrast. This is just a simple uh, highlight of uh, the unique features that lens-free microscopes output. Before I show you how we get higher resolution images and what you can do with these, I'd like to tell you a simple story about even where this kind of a simple microscope with a modest resolution on the order of one to two micrometers here could be useful, where this, this design could be useful. And that is actually for uh, monitoring of an HIV positive patient in extremely resource poor settings. For this problem, um, we're uh, focusing on the count of CD4 lymphocytes. So um, um, a healthy patient would have on the order of 1,000 uh, to, to 1,200 CD4s per microliter. But once HIV kicks in, that drops to uh, uh, a few hundred. That's the range where a, a simple uh, flu could be quite detrimental. And according to the World Health Organization, every three months, you need to sample the CD4 count of a, of a patient. Uh, this is today done using a flow cytometer, using these uh, devices, which are the gold standard uh, diagnostic tool for uh, counting cells in liquids. 
How many of you work with a flow cytometer? What was the smallest that you ever seen? Smallest cytometer. I mean, this is an old one, probably from early 2000 or uh, late 90s. Um, anyone worked with a smaller version than this? H how small was that? Okay, like a suitcase. Okay. So the price range is really high for these things. Even the suitcase versions are on the order of 10K or about. Uh, and the running costs are expensive. And uh, there are lots of things that uh, non-standard samples would clog the, uh, the, the flow site, and lots of other issues. So what we've done is we've combined lens-free imaging, these field-portable microscopes, with spatial microfluidic devices that can target sensitively and specifically subpopulations of white blood cells. So you're looking at a device here, like a disposable microfluidic chip, like a credit card sized uh, device, where the channel height here is on the order of 50 micrometers, sufficient for lymphocytes and red blood cells and all the rest to pass. But it has some surface chemistry to it so that it can specifically capture just the CD4 lymphocytes, or if you change this, CD8 lymphocytes. So the idea was to inject whole blood, wash it out, and selectively just capture the CD4s or anything that you want to uh, uh, image, and then uh, count using these lens-free microscopes. So this is an example of an HIV positive patient that is being tested by this. And what you see here, these spots are antibody islands. So each one of those um, circular spots is an antibody island and it has, as expected, captured from whole blood just those lymphocytes. In this case, we're looking at CD4s and CD8s because we're trying to understand a depletion of CD4s as a result of HIV and try to understand uh, if the ratio of CD4 to CD8 has reduced um, uh, due to, again, HIV. If you zoom into one of these spots, you would see holograms reconstructed and counted. Each one of these uh, is, a, is a corresponding a cell. and At the center, it has a white dot, which is the counting that uh, placed uh, that dot. And to some zoomed in images in comparison, these are CD4 holograms. This spot is an antibody island again. These are CD8s. Again, uh, CD4 to CD8 ratio is higher for this patient, as expected because it's a healthy patient in this case. And uh, for healthy patients, the ratio is high for uh, CD4 to CD8. But once HIV kicks in, that number drops to uh, significantly less than uh, 2, in some cases uh, around even 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And that's when you should start antiretroviral therapy. So this is one example where even though the resolution of the microscope is not sub-micrometer, uh, a field portable microscope with some surface chemistry, with some spatial microfluidic devices, could give you something that uh, normally a, a flow cytometer would be uh, able to uh, give. There are other kinds of techniques that you can use. In this, in this second work, we actually did the same um, uh, problem of identifying CD4 versus CD8. This time we used nanoparticles. For example, we labeled CD4 lymphocytes with gold nanoparticles. These nanoparticles are sub-100 nanometer particles that are plasmonically uh, scattering. So we can differentiate the, the uh, CD4 lymphocytes from CD8 based on gold versus silver nanoparticles that bind to the surface of the cell so that we can have sufficient separation between, uh, in this case, gold-labeled CD4s versus uh, the silver-labeled CD8s. And the rest is just unlabeled cells. So there are different kinds of techniques that can bring in, again, molecular specificity to uh, this kind of lens-free microscope. Uh, just to give you an idea, CD4 versus CD8, it's impossible to differentiate under a light microscope because the difference between CD4 and CD8 is so tiny for a light microscope to see. They are just the protein level differences. That's why you need, for a light microscope, a labeling scheme, either surface chemistry or a fluorophore, or in this case, nanoparticles that uh, change the scattering uh, morphology of the cell. Whatever I've shown you so far was uh, a microscope that is using a single light emitting diode. This is the same, th a light emitting diode is the same thing that you have in your cell phones. Whenever you have a new email, the thing that blinks is a light emitting diode, an LED. And we use one of those here, and this is where you load the sample. Again, the resolution of the system is, uh, is modest, it's around one to two micrometers. It's corresponding to, roughly speaking, a 10x objective that you have in your, uh, in your labs. How many of you work with a 10x objective in a microscope? So now this is the resolution level of these microscopes. 
not 20x, not 30x, around 10x, but much larger field of view. Those of you who work with a 10x, you would remember that it's just a maybe 2 millimeter by 2 millimeter field of view. These things are significantly larger. So that's a key signature of lens-free imaging. It has significantly larger field of view and depth of view compared to a conventional microscope. Now I'll tell you tricks how to make the resolution go to maybe 60x, 100x objective range while keeping this major advantage here the same. So we'll, we'll complicate this design to keep the field of view the same but push the resolution to deeply sub-micron. And that's what I'm going to talk about in, uh, in the next uh, few slides, which is about super resolution. How can we achieve super resolution with these lens-free microscopes? Of course, we've complicated the design from something like this, which was on the order of 45 grams or less, to something like this. It's taller, as you can see, but still as tall as maybe your iPhone. And the weight here is on the order of 130 grams or 135 grams, so lighter than your also iPhone. If you look inside, it looks complicated, uh, but it's still very simple to put together uh, and very inexpensive. We're using, instead of a single light source, some 20 of these, okay, where there's a microcontroller here, which turns these LEDs one by one on and off. This is where you load your sample, and this is the same silicon chip that you have, again, at the back of your cell phone. This is where you actively capture a light field. What happens here is, you insert your sample, and you lo you're looking at transmission holograms. But at a given time, only one LED is on. So you capture a hologram, but then you turn the LED so that another LED lights up, and then the, sh the holograms shift, start to shift, without you touching anything. So it's exactly the same thing as what happens when you're outside. You have a shadow on the street, but as the sun moves, from noon to 2 p.m. position, your shadow will start to shift. It's the same thing that's happening at the micro scale here. So the technology here is very similar to security cameras. If you're looking at a security camera at an airport, your face will be pixelated, just like this frame here. You can't really resolve the face of the person here because you're far away and the resolution of the system is not sufficient. But if you were to look at the same security camera and slightly move left and right so that you capture a movie, successive frames, where every frame is slightly shifted with respect to each other, you can synthesize what is called as pixel super resolved image by combining these 10 to 15 frames and improve the resolution of the system through pixel super resolution. This is the same trick here, except nothing is moving. The only thing that's moving is the light source. You turn one versus the other, and effectively, the holograms shift. Just like this, except now you will be looking at holograms of the sample. This enables us to keep the field of view the same, but improve resolution. To the level where you can generate a billion useful pixels, a gigapixel. For example, using the state-of-the-art CMOS imager, so this thing that you see here is taken out of a cell phone. That's a high-end phone, which is on the order of 10 megapixels here. And it has a very small pixel size. It's one of the best, uh, uh, best phones that we have in terms of cameras. But if you were to use this in a lens-free microscope, you would be looking at a very large area. The active area here, the field of view, is on the order of 20 millimeters square. So it's very, very large. And it has almost a diffraction-limited performance. It can see around 200 nanometer gratings. So these are 200 nanometer lines that are written using a nanotechnology tool like Focus IMB milling, and it, it, it can resolve these things across a very large field of view. Roughly speaking, this is a, a billion useful pixels there, a gigapixel, and it's essentially, um, in terms of resolution, equivalent to maybe 60x to 100x, depending on, on, on the numerical aperture, but it's almost diffraction limited. And, um, of course, this field of view is around two orders of magnitude larger than a conventional microscope. Why do we care about field of view? Why are we so much obsessed about generating a billion useful pixels? Most often, if you're a pathologist, you'll be looking at things that are rare. As an example, if you were to look at a malaria thin smear, you'd be looking at red blood cells, try to identify if that red blood cell is infected or not. But that infection 
happens only uh, less than a percent of the time. So that's why you need to screen large areas and look for red blood cells or, or um, these, uh, uh, um, uh, these signatures all the way from one part of the sample to the other. And that's where a conventional microscope will be looking at these tiny circles here, whereas uh, you would have a very large field of view. Uh, again, more than two orders of magnitude, wider field of view. And for example, under a regular microscope, this is how an infected cell would look like. This is a red blood cell, and this purple looking thing is a gives a stained red uh, parasite that's invading the red blood cell. But this thing happens only again, typically uh, less than a, a percent of the time. And uh, these are the lens free images that show the same signature reconstructed using a field portable microscope, except over a very large field of view so that you can, um, uh, you can reduce false, uh, false negatives significantly because it takes a while to take this small field of view and scan across a large uh, sample. And these are some other generations. This is a color microscope. <coughs> and uh, it generates color images using a similar principle. These are pep smears, Papa Nicolau smears, where um, you're looking at um, in this case, these are the, the cellular features, and the pathologist will be looking at the ratio of uh, this, the, the nucleus to the cytoplasm in this case to understand what's going on. These are lens for reconstructed images, and these are conventional microscope images, showing you again apples for apples, across a very large field of view that you can, uh, you can use these field portal microscopes. These are obtained with a CMOS imager that's taken from a cell phone, essentially. These are the same things that we have at the cell phone. And that's why the field of view is large. The scale bar is a millimeter here, so you're looking at something on the order of 20 to 30 millimeters square. Already very large. But depending on your application, there are also other imagers that you would find in, for example, telescopes, in high-end digital cameras, and those are CCDs. And if you were to use a CCD rather than a CMOS that's at the cell phone, this scale bar here, would shift from a millimeter to a centimeter. Now you can, for example, look at, instead of 20, 30 millimeters square, now you can look at almost 2,000 millimeters square. And that's where you, all of a sudden, are three orders of magnitude wider than a conventional microscope. For example, this is a CCD. The scale bar is a centimeter. This is more than 1.5 gigapixels here. A conventional microscope will be looking at this tiny circle here, whereas we can look at the entire thing and give you a, these images, these are human sperms. These are submicron tails of the sperms. And this is a conventional microscope looking at the same specimen, except again, uh, over a very tiny area over here. These are unique microscopes in the sense that depending on your application, you can select different kinds of sensors. You can go for a variety of sensors for your resolution and field of view. And the important, other important thing is that the, the tie between field of view and resolution is now broken. How many of you uh, used a microscope uh, and uh, work with 10x and 20x objective lens? Immediately, uh, if you go to higher magnification objectives for higher resolution, you sacrifice the field of view. And that's a fundamental trade-off of conventional light microscopy. Field of view and resolution are coupled to each other. These microscopes don't have that same coupling. I can improve resolution and field of view at the same time. For example, this is a certain uh, CMOS imager. It has, let's say, 10 megapixels and a certain pixel size. Next year, based on the Moore's law, based on the curve that I've shown you at the very beginning, we get better sensors that have more megapixels and smaller pixel size. Then all of a sudden, I will improve the field of view and resolution with the speed of the Moore's law at the same time. This is, let's say, a 10 megapixel. If you were to give me 15 megapixel, I would just buy 50% more field of view. If you give me 20 megapixels, I would double the field of view here without changing the resolution. And those are kind of unique, uh, unique uh, microscopes that essentially break the trade-off between resolution and field of view, and they now improve with the speed of the Moore law, Moore's law. We are riding on a curve that we haven't created on, on a wave, and that's essentially helping us to improve the, the performance of these microscopes. You can even see uh, single viruses with this, uh, with this uh, platform. Over the same field of view, over the same giant area, we can see individual viruses uh, using a very interesting technology 
where we um, self-assembled with self-assembled nano lenses around individual particles. So this experiment is very interesting in the sense that um, if you take, for example, two rings, these are micro scale of rings, like almost the size of, uh, of, of a uh, regular ring. If you dip them into a soap solution and take them apart, you would form a thin membrane here. And this membrane is exactly what's happening at the nano scale around individual nanoparticles or cells so that we can see them even though they're tiny. A virus is typically on the order of 100 nanometers, 200 nanometers. It's very small and it's very difficult to see with light microscopes because wavelength of light is much larger, typically like 500 nanometers. Through these nano lenses that self-assemble, exactly the same process, cut this in half and place the particle in, in, in here. That's exactly what's happening as shown here with this cartoon. Using that, we've, we've seen actually things that are sub-100 nanometers routinely over a very large field of view. Now the comparison is a scanning electron microscope. So for example, this is a 70 nanometer particle, and uh, these are uh, the lens free reconstructions over a very large field of view. So this throughput would be very useful, for example, for looking for um, viral load in, in patients. So you can functionalize this area, and all of a sudden, the surface would selectively and sensitively capture just, for example, the HIV or other kinds of viruses. Then you can count them without the need for an SEM, which is the gold standard for these things. So it, it opens unique opportunities, and um, these are some um, H1N1 viruses at the single particle level imaged using these lens-free uh, microscopes. Each one of these uh, dots is a single virus. So in addition to uh, vertical imaging, you can also do tomography with this platform in the sense that you can take a light source here and rotate it along an arc and at every angle, slightly jitted light source as shown here, and capture a pixel super result cross section and then advance. This is very similar to X-ray computed tomography. When the body uh, of the patient goes there, there's an uh, X-ray source and a detector around the body that rotate and capture different pro projections of the uh, for example, the lungs, and then they computed tomogram. You can do the same thing here, except this is now optical version of it on a chip lens-free. Um, this is, for example, a movie that shows you a very large volume that is being tomographically reconstructed. So different regions here are being reconstructed in depth. So this is the depth that is changing, and these are five micron objects that are being uh, sliced as a tomogram. The advantage here is the volume. This is a more than a thousand fold larger volume than a conventional microscope. A conventional microscope is limited in the field of view and depth of field. Now we're slicing these things up to a millimeter in height. That's where the advantage uh, is, a large volume. And you can put this in a field portable design. This is actually a field portable tomographic microscope. And um, this is how you get the diversity in angle. So light emitting diodes are, um, uh, are um, uh, shifting in angle. This is where you load your sample. If you pay attention to this movie, every light source at a given angle is being actuated electromagnetically. So there's nothing that's touching there. So this is now moving out of the board and in plane to give you pixel super resolution and then higher resolution per angle to uh, create a tomogram. So indeed, uh, you can do three-dimensional imaging. So, so far, everything was stationary. We were looking at microscale things that are fixed, that are disposable. And uh, we, we weren't looking at live things, and we were essentially looking at, uh, as we play with the light source, we were looking at fixed specimen that cannot move. Okay? Now I'll sh show you some examples where lens-free on-chip imaging could look at moving specimen at the micro and nano scale, but at a very large throughput. And one, one example that I'll show you is actually the motion of the human sperm, and animal sperm. Uh, so using uh, the same geometry here, where we place a specimen very close to the sensor, the uh, optoelectronic sensor here, we record their shadows. But now, specimen is a human sperm, and they're moving randomly. And we're trying to, by looking at their shadows, try to uh, locate their sperm head. Human sperm head is like a rugby ball, slightly flattened, and it's on the order of four microns. Okay? 
And they are moving very fast, typically 50 to 100 microns per second. And they are moving in three dimensions. So we'd like to track them as they're naturally moving around, but not just a few of them. We want to track them in thousands. In thousands at submicron level while they're moving around 3D. And at the end, we want to create volumetric images like this, which is, again, very large field of view and very large depth of field, so that compared to a conventional optical microscope, we can look at something like 100-fold to 1,000-fold more sperms in three dimensions. So out of this work, with this platform, we've come up with some new uh, movies, new uh, motion times that happen uh, at the uh, micro scale with, with, uh, with human sperm or animal sperm. And I'm showing you one example here, which is a human sperm conducting a helix in three dimensions. So that's the motion. It's a second. So this is only a second of that motion, where it's done 10 rotations per second. This is the front view. As expected, it's like, almost like a circle. A very fast one, but more importantly, look at the dimension here. It's very, very tight. It's like 2-3 microns in diameter. This type of emotion would be almost impossible to record with a conventional light microscope. As a matter of fact, this is the first movie that shows you directly how in 3D human sperms conduct helices. So this is literally the first time that this movie has been generated, even though light microscopes are at least a century old. And uh, one challenge here for a conventional microscope is that this sperm is moving in depth with a certain angle because the Z here is essentially depth. A conventional microscope being focused to a certain depth would quickly miss this because it's very fast and it will be going out of focus. Lens-free imaging doesn't care about out of focus because we digitally time reverse after we've acquired all these images. So we can focus all the way from here to there without an issue and we know where exactly the sperm was in three dimensions with submicron accuracy. In addition to this, this challenge, conventional microscopes are also low throughput. They can only look at a very tiny volume. This happens only 4% of the time in humans in vitro. It's only 4% of the time. That's why you got to be really lucky to find a sperm doing this with a lower uh, field of view and lower depth of field of conventional microscope. That's where I think we have some unique angle to, to capture something like this for the first time. Here is another one. It's a hyperactivated human sperm. It's the same idea. It's a helix. However, it's more ir irregular and larger in, 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 in terms of diameter. So it has more energy to spend. This is hyperactivated and it's looking to fertilize an egg problem. Um, so with this platform, we looked at thousands of human sperm trajectories, more than 24,000. And uh, we've characterized everything about these these are uh, human sperms. And um, motility uh, in terms of, of linearity, uh, the rotation speeds, each one of these dots is actually a human sperm trajectory. What we found out of these 24,000 trajectories is that only 45%, like a thousand of them, were helical. And out of these helical, out of these thousand sperms that were conducting a helix, 90% of them were right-handed. So 90% were actually conducting a helix, like a right-handed right one. And only 10%, which is corresponding to 96 out of 24,000, doing a left-handed helix. So the ratio was pretty uh, interestingly uh, 90 to 10%. How many of you are, are left-handed? Roughly speaking, 10% of the audience. I mean, if you count all the words. So, um, of course, there is no correlation. It's just a, just a funny, uh, <laughs> fun, funny thing. <laughs> but this is a good example where these kinds of studies would not be possible with conventional light microscopes because of their inherent limitations in terms of volume, in terms of field of view, depth of field, as well as in terms of uh, essentially uh, working with um, three-dimensional uh, rapid motion. And since then, actually, we've discovered some new kinds of motion that were never identified before. And this new motion is in the form of a ribbon where you can think of the sperm head 
moving along a plane. So think about a sinusoid, sine wave. It's moving left and right with a sine wave in a plane. This ribbon, forming a straight plane, is twisting in the form of these, these ribbons, like helical ribbon or a twisted ribbon. So the sperm head uh, does these kinds of interesting uh, motion. I'll show you one example with horse sperm. This is a horse sperm. This is the second, so this is the three-dimensional motion, and this is the planar uh, like, uh, front view. I'll fast forward it to give you the three-dimensional uh, feeling of, of, of the uh, helical ribbon here. So this is a planar motion where, again, the plane itself is twisting like a um, helix would do. This is, again, uh, for the first time that any microsumer has been shown to uh, uh, conduct this kind of a regular motion. We have actually mathematically uh, defined this uh, exactly in the form of a helical ribbon with a sine wave on a plane that the plane is twisting. So it's a very regular motion that is uh, formed by ribbons. This is another one. It's a different kind of a ribbon twisting. And I'll, I'll show it to you uh, in this movie. I'll fast forward it so that you can uh, see uh, the, the 3D na nature of this ribbon. These give you great examples where non-conventional imaging techniques where computation is used to uh, replace analog components could really shed some more light and even uh, create discoveries, uh, enable discoveries that remained uh, unidentified, such as this, this, this motion here. This motion, by the way, is called a helicoid. It's a mathematical construct and it's, it's really a, a very interesting uh, functional form. So, I've, I've so far talked about essentially uh, holographic imaging, where these are bright field microscope, mi microscopes that are looking at uh, images in transmission. But we, we've also done work with fluorescent um, samples. So we've created fluorescent microscopes with a different kind of an attachment. These are not lens-free microscopes anymore. These are uh, 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 not based on holography because fluorescence is a different kind of light which you can't easily uh, apply holographic principles. But essentially using compact and cost-effective interfaces, we have created uh, um, fluorescent microscopes, very inexpensive, and, um, uh, um, and uh, this is a fluorescent flow cytometer. Um, they generate very nice images with good contrast. These are waterborne parasites. This is a whole blood sample. These are labeled white blood cells. Um, a conventional microscope would be looking like this, and this is like a cell phone microscope. If you don't want to capture a static image, you can actually look for a microfluidic device here where you inject uh, whole blood. And as it's flowing, uh, this is a slowed down movie, you count uh, white blood cells that are labeled. And essentially, uh, uh, through this counting process, you identify the speed of the flow as well as the count to give you density, like cells per microliter. In this case, it was around 5,000 cells per microliter, giving you a very nice match to a a Coulter counter for the same blood sample. So since then we've done different kinds of blood analyzers. This is the latest generation published in 2013. Um, a smart application which is used for image processing um, and uh, a different attachment for red blood cell measurements, white blood cell fluorescent measurements, and hemoglobin density measurements, all of which go at the back of the cell phone and then there's a smart application there. So. To summarize, um, I've introduced a, a platform which utilizes computation to bring in new um, imaging, sensing, and diagnostic modalities integrated to cell phones or utilizing cell phone components to create very competitive images that have very large fields of view, very large depths of field, and uh, give you essentially a significantly uh, a larger uh, throughput than a conventional optical microscope. It has even led to some new discoveries in the, in the form of identifying new motion types for uh, human sperms, which could be quite useful for various different uh, studies, including, for example, in vitro fertilization or even for animal farms, breeding applications. You need to identify the um, sperm motility, sperm quality using field portable design. So that was our motivation before we, st we started to look at uh, these rare events that we observed in, um, in ho human and horse sperms, for example.
So there's a lot of opportunity that these kinds of microscopes could really help us with our microanalysis and, um, and micro, micro uh, imaging, nano imaging needs uh, uh, in field portable or at advanced uh, settings for extreme throughput. With this, I'd like to um, um, conclude, but before I uh, conclude, I'd like to come back to this slide again. This was the slide that I showed at the very beginning. It was a comparison of the Moore's law and how it compares to a me megapixel count of cell phones over the last 10 years. I want to come back to this point where this is at the top of the uh, Moore's law, where it's the uh, 40 megapixel Nokia phone. And I'll tell you a story of what this enabled us to achieve. Using this cell phone here, essentially, we uh, were able to image individual viruses for the first time using a cell phone attachment. For example, this is the same 40 megapixel cell phone at the top of the Moore's law as of today. And using a, a, a smart interface, as shown here, this is the back of the cell phone, this is the front. It's still very lightweight. Uh, we were able to image individual human cytomegaloviruses. These are virus particles that are on the order of 100 to 200 nanometers in size. And they are labeled by their capsid proteins. And then you can have essentially a single viral particle to be imaged on the cell phone. This is a high-end confocal microscope that's photon counting the same field of view to show you that we indeed get apples for apples. And this is a milestone in the sense that for the last three years, if you were to ask me, can you image on a cell phone a virus particle, and I say the virus particle, I would say, of course not. It's, it's very challenging. It's even challenging for a, a $200,000 microscope to image. This is a very high-end microscope that's uh, located at CNSI, California Nanosystems Institute. So in that regard, this is really showing you where this trend, this wave, the Moore's Law, is helping us to rapidly achieve milestones that seemingly are very, very, very challenging, such as indiv individual nanoparticles or viruses that are fluorescent labeled. But now this is routinely achieved in our lab that we can uh, look for even sub-100 nanometer particles that are individually isolated. With this, I'd like to conclude, and thank you very much.